All right, we're right now we're talking to Sandra Singh Lowe. And your book is called The Mad Woman in the Volvo, My Year of Raging Hormones. First of all, thank you for joining Bookview Now and PBS at the Miami Book Fair International. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So reading this book, obviously, there's, there, I, I laughed hysterically at it. And yet, there's a lot of pain in this book at the same time. There were times when I was reading it where I actually felt like uh, it was so honest, I felt almost guilty laughing. But you have a way of creating humor in some of the, the most painful and dark moments of your life. Um, well, thank you for that. I mean, th this certainly this story is a midlife crisis story. It's a menopause story, but also a midlife crisis of like having an affair while married, sort of traumatically blowing one's life up. You know, it used to be only men had the midlife crises, and so I, I had that. So there were definitely parts when I was experiencing this that did not feel funny to me at the time. I think, you know, when I, I have the affair with a married man and then we get together, then he moves home for a bit and I'm alone in this 750 square foot bachelor cabin, you know, wisely pairing Ambien and white wine <laughs> and sort of waking up that I've slapped on my arm with a, a broken, a claw, sort of this, you know, per, you know, this, this, that I tried to sort of do everything with this claw. And it was really a ridiculously bad time. But now that I look back, you yeah. know, but I think that when you're in it, um, you know, it's, it's not funny at the time, but when you tell your story, I have had so many people come to me and confess all this midlife stuff and all, all you know, marriages, being tough affairs, et cetera, et cetera, that I think we all go through, not as extreme as I did, but some, some version of, of just midlife churn. Yeah, I did learn that the mixing ambient and white wine could result in a claw arm. That was something <laughs> I would be careful with. Saturday night yeah. Yeah. elbow. Yeah. Right, and also you learned that maybe going to Burning Man at 46 years old is not a good idea. Yeah, which we'll talk about. You did say, though, that, um, that you know, it, before only men had midlife crises, but of course, women did go through menopause and had the same sort of emotional breakdowns and you said in your book there was a point where you talk about women in older generations who would basically throw the pyrex at the wall in a moment of of craziness and that was the that was how you knew that they were going through something really difficult right but it was very mysterious to us yeah because my mom was in, like in the 60s and 70s and there were these perfect women standing in the kitchen and their you know yellow daisy aprons singing doris d okay sera, sera, and, you know, kind of like drying the dishes and then suddenly She's hurling the dishes, and nobody knows why. It's never talked about. And the women would go. To, our moms would go the, to their darkened bedrooms for hours, or days, or weeks, or months. Or in one case, um, this woman said her mom went to bed for four years, four years in this darkened bedroom. But wow. of course, it was in North Dakota, so you know, winters are long. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's like you say, parenting has changed, and, and women have changed, and, and and children have changed, and growing up, so has how we deal with menopause or how women deal with menopause and you're an example of that obviously it's it's all in this book and this sort of honest hilarious portrayal of it but maybe you can talk a little bit about how in your mind you've seen the sort of the, uh, the experience of menopause changing with women. Yeah, I, I think when, and I originally did this as a piece for The Atlantic that was assigned to me that I first didn't want to do because I didn't want to be sort of equated with menopause because it has so many sort of negative connotations of being old and crepey and dry and there's lots of dryness in every part of the body. <laughs> but then I started researching it and I saw first of all that from the Greeks on they've written about it and there, there was even sort of in the 1800s the first official book about menopause that, listen, 137 symptoms like uh, temporary deafness and pseudo narcolepsy and uncontrollable peevishness and something called uh, hysterical flatulence. <laughs> as opposed to other flatulence. But then, as recently as in 1900, you know, the American lifespan was 47 years old. Right. 47. So most menopausal women were, in fact, you know, technically dead, which is not great, although they were finally getting sleep, which many women have not had for years and years. So, but now that we live so much longer, you know, women live into their 80s and 90s. So the oldest living citizen is a 116-year-old woman living in Arkansas. So instead of menopause being the change, fertility is the change, because we're only fertile those middle, like 25 or 30 years of our life. The middle third, most of the time, we're not making eggs. And in fact, in menopause, a woman's hormone levels go back to those as a preteen girls. So it's kind of the return, not the change, but the return to where we were before at age 12 or so, that estrogen cloud 
came down, the fertility cloud came down, and we started sort of cutting up sandwiches for other people and folding their socks in a glaze <laughs> while everybody else was lying around like a normal, you know, able-bodied person who's just quite delighted to have mom working for them 24-7. So that's when the dream, like fertility, was when you go into the glaze, not when it was. Well, I think that's the, for me, as I read it, as a man reading this book, I recognized that so many people around you in your life at the time had no idea what was going on with you, either your children who can't understand menopause right. yet, or your husband, Mr. X at the right. time, who right. has a difficult time understanding menopause. Right. And here you are, you have these friends who can relate and who can give you ideas about what's happening to you. But the people in your direct circle are confused by everything they're seeing. Right, and I think that you're not really a good reporter of what's going on with you. You know, you can be, it, it opens with me just kind of driving and I think of suddenly uh, the Trader Joe's parking lot and their mid-afternoon samples that are so bad and buying this ropey dough. And I, and instead of just being irritated, I just pull to the side of the road. I just start weeping uncontrollably because I can't cope. And then of course you have a friend that says, well, you may be in entering menopause, and you go, great. But the next day, you totally forget. So <laughs> like, it's like Groundhog Day over again. We go, yeah. what's wrong with me? What's <laughs> wrong with me? And shut up. And you know, and, and, you know, and the women can't. I, I find like our serotonin drops around 4 in the afternoon. So even though a family dinner is supposed to take place at 7, and you're supposed to sit with people yeah. and have them talk to you while you're eating, which I think is completely uncivilized. You know, Some of us women actually would like to have dinner at like 4 in the afternoon, right. sort of an icy cave in Alaska go with no one around, um, you know, some little vodka and, you know, our Weight Watchers points of Pinot Grigio. So I, I think that there is a circle of women who know they can't always explain it. The right. men can only be mystified. The kids are hiding. But, and I did find that then if you try to go to a bookstore and buy books, I've had men who tell me they bought the book on Kindle at midnight for their wife and thank me for it because the books on menopause are really not helpful. It's, you know, it's always a sort of a dietary, it's always, uh, oh, so you're angry, bloated, frustrated, n night sweats, et cetera, just cut out alcohol, sugar, and caffeine, which is a laugh. <laughs> That's what keeps many of us going. So I think it's, it's a mystery to everyone what's going on, and it's not easily solved just by giving them sugar. But you did talk about one book that you sort of put on a pedestal, Christiane yes. Northrup's Christian, The Wisdom of Menopause. Exactly. And that is to do the trick for you. Yes, it's the Bible. And there's a quote on the front of her book that says, this is the Bible, and that's a quote by me, although they quote The Atlantic. Um, and it's a fantastic book. In fact, I read it in my 30s, because I was fascinated by the phrase, the wisdom of menopause. And, and that's what she means is when Aunt Edna suddenly flings the pork roast through the glass window, she's not going mad. She's actually going sane, because she's realizing what is this pork chop and why, or pot roast? Why have I been making this for you? You feed yourselves freaking dinner. And that's the moment where actually the wisdom comes on. So, and it's a great book. The only problem is it is about 700 pages and middle-aged women with short attention spans have a difficult time getting through it. So I wanted to do the for dummies version. Right. Well, I, I enjoyed it. And you, there's, a part, there's a part in the book too where you talk about parenting uh, under the effects of menopause and oh. what a challenge that is. Oh yeah. Uh, especially as your life was coming unspooled at one point. Uh, at the same time, you're still trying to be a great mother to your daughters. Oh, yeah, and I, I know that you have four children, so you guys are yeah. really going to be um, going through that roller coaster. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, and Irma Bombeck had this great line of, you know, I, I wonder at the generation they've adjusted the, you know, clock for childbearing such that entering menopause and teaching a 16 year old to drive is going to happen in the same week. And that's basically, I, an old mom, I had kids at 38 and 48. 40, 40, I guess it's like the National Geographic turtle who washes up on the beach with her last leathery eggs. So now my <laughs> girls are 12 and 14, right. and I'm 52, and we're all, it's just a hormonal stew in yeah. the house at all times. I understand that. I'm, I'm not going to come visit for a while if that's okay. Oh, no, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy. It's yeah, crazy. well, you know, the, um, the other thing is that you had uh, Mr. X and then Mr. Y, and you met Mr. Y when you were at Burning Man. You mentioned <laughs> Burning Man earlier. I couldn't let you get away without talking about Burning Man and what the heck were you doing there? So, yeah, it's, it's very, well, I think when women turn 40, I was with a bunch of women who we, we sort of, there was a baby boom around you know, the September 11th time because people go, oh, my God, the world's coming to an end. We're all going to have kids. So we, we all sort of had kids a little bit late, all at the same time. And then when our kids were preschoolers and kindergartners, we were in that hormonal flush in Los Angeles. And that was covered in my last book, Mother on Fire, that we go, 
oh my gosh, we're going to take back our urban poor schools and send our kids there and teach everyone to play the violin and do a class garden. So we had this huge burst of energy um, and it, finding the church of public school. And at the extreme height of it, I actually organized a political rally in Sacramento, which is seven hours away, of like a hundred women and children camping and playing the guitar. We all learned to drive RVs. And once you learn to drive an RV, it's you, you, you go, oh my God, what are we going to do yeah. next? Let's go to Burning Man to see the art, right? So, so, so a bunch of us women pack into RVs to go to Burning Man. And as a chaperone, we take along my longtime, you know, theatrical manager and partner to help drive the, you know, RV and actually another male. And, and so sort of as a chaperone. And so we, we get there, but things happen at Burning Man. I, I mean, it's, it's in the book and it's part of this show I'm developing on the book where the, the playa, have you been to Burning Man? No. But you will. Yeah. And when you do. I have the, been in an RV, so that's next. <laughs> so the playa yeah. is this circle of sand in the middle with the Burning Man sure. in the middle, who is a Burning Man, is like this wooden effigy. And there's something when middle-aged people get into the desert and they're not properly hydrating, they become really <laughs> hysterical. And people liken the playa to a kind of truth serum. Yeah. So suddenly happily married people, you know, who have the same alternative families and they make their own beer and they play kazoos at Christmas and they make their own bread and they have the, their, their kids are at the really good charter schools for gifted children, they suddenly turn to each other and go, I am having an affair with this porno <laughs> actor I met through the, like suddenly you go, whoa, <laughs> people start turning to each other and you see, and you go, I did not want to know that about you because we are, our families have Christmas together and now you're telling me, you're a 44 year old, you're you know, in the middle of the 40s when people start to really start lo losing it or quietly losing it. It's like this truth serum that all this stuff started coming out. Right. And so then I, I turned to my theatrical manager partner who I'd been friends with for 10 years and suddenly it's this merchant ivory moment where you go, it is you whom I love, <laughs> but nothing will ever happen because we're married and now excuse me while I go throw my youth into the fire, which is exactly what I said. So it, I mean, just this kind of glaze comes on. So again, Bernie, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, it, it's such a cliche. It, it's really a cliche, Burning Man, at this point. And it's all middle-aged people writing checks to be there, you know, and they're all from Seattle or Silicon Valley playing hacky sack and they're like 62. I mean, it is ridiculous, but it is very, it does have a powerful pull because it's kind of like going back to college in a wacky way. It, it has an intellectual pull there, there, it, that, that one must just experience once uh, and well, then never again. I, I, I'm going to take your advice one of these <laughs> days. Once. Um, you have, you talk about your um, performances and, and so much of, what, uh, of your storytelling is in this book, but you also uh, are a performance artist. You, you have right. one person shows and, right. and uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that side of this and the fact that you're developing this out for a larger show is really interesting to me too. Yeah, no, it's, it's been great. I, I've done a couple of solo shows off Broadway back in my youth at Second Stage Theater and then I didn't for a while, a while. and then the, the Sundance Theater Lab started helping me develop this and um, and they workshopped it at New York at the 92nd Street Y and Joe's Pub and the Ojai Play Rats Rights Festival did too and it was interesting sort of coming back after having done solo shows in my 30s when you're kind of the new kid on the block and it's multicultural and she's a, and then when you're kind of going back at like 51 or so going what why now why would I make a seventh one person show what do I have to say you know I w then I was young and perky now I'm I don't know what I am but then as I started developing this story and I think the Burning Man story that's actually sort of was the kickoff it's it's much more of a piece than it's a l than it is in this book about really that whole trajectory and just the the the, the excitement and then the passion and then the sorrow and the horror and the guilt of falling in love in midlife while you're married and have a family and then pursuing that and go and and taking all the consequences and and I think that became itself a mesmerizing story to tell in a group of people because it's the real stuff of life and that I found sort of that's one of the sort of renaissances in middle age you go well because you, you really have a story to tell now because you've seen some stuff so it became this interesting a great experience of doing this piece and so I think I'll probably keep workshopping it for a while but it's been 
it's it's been great to do that. And then for the first time, we added two actresses on the side on to fill in conversations on music stands. So it's like not vagina monologues or love loss and what I wear. I've, I've performed in both those shows actually in LA and and in different places. And it's so it's so fun to have a piece that other actresses can do because it's not like there we don't have women actresses of middle age and up who aren't fantastic you know if I if I could I'd put 12 women on the stage because there's so many brilliant actresses who are amazing to yeah. help tell the story well we're looking forward to that too but in the meantime the, the, the written book is the mad woman in the Volvo my year of raging hormones Sandra Singwell thank you so much for joining us today my Larry, pleasure really Rich. Funny. yeah and good Great luck with you. that yeah, <laughs>